Welcome back, everybody, to Honor of Kings. And uh, this is our uh, first episode as we explore into the Book of Enoch. And I'm Sean Griffin, and my co-host with me today is Ken yeah, Heidelberg. Hey, Ken, it's good to see you again. Yeah, you yeah, too, man. Too, man. Too long. Okay, man. So we are, uh, this is Honor of Kings. It, um, we are dice diving deep and dissecting the extra-biblical books. Uh, books that used to be in the canon that were taken out, and we're going to look at them and see um, some of the themes in them and some of the, the content, how it lines up with the modern American canon of 66 to help us kind of discern a little bit better on why they may have been taken out or why maybe they should have been left in, you know, and that's kind of the bigger the bigger question we're going to explore throughout this series. And we're also going to be looking at the Book of Enoch um, this year. We uh, formerly, we were on a different network and a different channel, and so we were exploring the Book of Jubilees. And for all those who had seen those previous episodes, we are going to go back to the Book of Jubilees. But we, Ken and I, decided that we wanted to uh, reboot this this uh, show, starting off with the Book of Enoch. Yeah, it's a awesome book, Sean, and um, I think a lot of people are probably more familiar with the Book of Enoch than some of the other ones. So. I think it's a good decision to go with this one um, as a reboot. And uh, yeah, we're going to see how it lines up with scriptures and it'll be fun. This is a, um, it's a fascinating book, man, because there's so much in here that is directly coherent with what we see Peter talking about, what we see Jesus talking about. Um, it's just, there's a lot of meat in this book and a lot of people um, have never been exposed to it. Because someone told them that it's, you know, it's bad. So uh, we're going to go through what it actually teaches and compare it to the scriptures so that you can determine for yourself whether or not it's bad. Um, Ken and I um, have both studied this book pretty thoroughly, and we've already come to the conclusion that it's good. As we go through these things, we're going to be lining them up with scriptures, like I said, in different places, according to the themes and the content the scripture teaches. But we're, we're not going to just be um, cheerleaders for the Book of Enoch. Like We're going to try to remain as objective and fair as possible. We're, we may run across a few passages that we don't fully understand, as far, but we're going to try to research them to understand them. And you guys get to watch us do that on this show. So yeah. that's the fun part. Amen. All right. So we're going to start off right here in the Book of Enoch, um, in Chapter 1. And Ken, do you want to read the? the yeah, I'll read the first uh, verse bit there, Sean. The words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous, who will be living in the day of tribulation, when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. So, Sean, right there is a, it's an interesting little prologue, isn't it? Kind of sets the tone for uh, who this is kind of written to. Yeah. And. Um, I think there's an interesting little phrase here. We're living in the day of tribulation. And the day of tribulation, according to my research and understanding of uh, you know, the scriptures as a whole, um, is synonymous with a few things. I'm just going to quickly, if you don't mind, list them off, what I've compiled. And there probably are some even more um, synonyms uh, that relate to the day of tribulation here. But from what I gather, uh, it's just like the day of the Lord, the great day of the Lord, the great day, the great and terrible day, the day of the Lord's anger, the day of judgment, the day of visitation, the day of tribulation, the day of trouble, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloomness, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet, the time of trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble, the day of wrath, that day, the day, your day, the day of the new creation, and the appointed day. So... Those are all just kind of strewn throughout the scriptures. And in my opinion, they all mean the same thing, the day of the Lord. And it's talking about the day when the consummation of the ages comes. And at the last day is contextually talking about this specific day. So this first verse here in Enoch is in reference to that, I believe. You think that that first, that first phrase is just saying those who are still alive on that last day at the Messiah's return? In my opinion, this is this is referring to we'll be living in the day of tribulation. So, like the times of the day of tribulation leading up. Okay. Okay. So yeah. that's what it's like. So, because obviously it tells us a lot of uh, 
interesting um, events and gives us characters that we see later on in the book of Revelation. So if this were being read by people that were going to encounter that time period leading up to the day of tribulation, the day of the return of the Lord, the day of the Lord, then it would be good for them to know this, right? So that they can be aware of what's happening and what why it's happening. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a pretty strong first statement to start out with, um, just to try to get people's attention. <laughs> yeah, it's what caught my eye when I first started reading yeah. this and studying it. It was, wait a minute, I've heard that, the day of tribulation. That sounds a lot like all the other ones that I just mentioned. And uh, it's really fascinating, eschatological-wise, um, what's all related and how much Enoch was shown, what's going to happen in those days. Absolutely. Okay, so in uh, verse 2 here, and he took up his parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man, whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me. And from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw. But not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is for to come. So as we were saying earlier, the, this is talking about a remote generation that's to come during the times of the day of the tribulation. So the latter days, the consummation of the ages. And concerning the elect, I said, and took up my parable concerning them, the Holy Great One will come forth from his dwelling. So this is, right, Sean, this is talking about the day of the Lord, correct? Like right. these verses that are following is in reference to his day when he comes and he sends Yeshua with right. the king and all the myriads of holy angels. So the Holy Great One will come forth from his dwelling and the eternal God will tread upon the earth, even on Mount Sinai, and appear in the strength of his might from the heaven of heavens. And all shall be smitten with fear, and the watchers shall quake, and great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth. And the high mountains shall be shaken, and the high hills shall be made low, and shall melt like wax before the flame. And the earth shall be wholly rent and sunder, and all that is upon the earth shall perish, and there shall be a judgment upon all men. So... That's a great day if you're someone who's going to be resurrected and saved, correct? Yeah, and that's, you know, we've talked about this in other, other places, but, you know, the, the first resurrection of the saints of God, the righteous, the dead in Christ, they're all raised at the beginning of this great day um, so that they don't have to endure all this wrath and judgment that happens. And they're, they're taken and protected away into the New Jerusalem, as Isaiah 26 tells us, and many other places. But it happens at the last trumpet. Um, which is, you know, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, uh, Revelation 11, uh, verse 15, I believe. In many other places, the last trumpet is when the first resurrection happens. The righteous are raised incorruptible into, you know, spiritual mortal bodies. They're taken, hidden away, and protected in the New Jerusalem, away from all this fear and quaking and trembling and mountains being made low and melting like wax before a flame and all the judgment upon the earth that's happening. Um, those are for the wicked. Those are for the people that rejected the gospel, the kingdom of God, and rejected the Messiah. And so right. a couple of quick things I wanted to ask about as you read these, these seven verses here. Um, verse 3, Ken, it says, The Holy Great One will come forth from his dwelling. Now, if I didn't know better, it would look like, you know, who's the Holy Great One? Is this the Almighty or is this somebody different? Well, I mean, we know that this could either be referring to Yeshua, the Son, right. or... And that's the extra context of all the other prophetic books tell us that it's Yeshua that comes with his angels, just like Yeshua says in Matthew 25, 31, that it's Yeshua comes with his with angels, but Yeshua is the arm of power working in the agency of the Father to do this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, the elect one, the righteous one. Yeah. And those, yeah. those people that's we're going to see throughout Enoch, right? That that's going to be his you know common title is elect one, righteous one, son of man. Yes, absolutely. You know what? We're going to get in. I think it's chapter 10. Um, or it could be chapter 14, but we're actually going to see another idiomatic phrase for the Messiah called the plant of righteousness, yes. which lines up really well with him being called the root of Jesse and the branch, the branch. of Zechariah and other places. So that's uh, Enoch also is, uh, has similarities there. Um, verse 5, though, when it talks about um, all shall be smitten with fear, the watchers shall quake. Great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth. Who are the watchers, Ken? Well, they're a particular class of angel, um, in my opinion, who rebelled. And that's found in the canon, Genesis 6, uh, also referred to in Jude's small book. Um, doesn't, they're a class of angels that, sorry, go ahead. Doesn't the book of Daniel also refer to the watchers? 
Yes, he does. Yeah, he does. Yeah. So we've got um, three three books in the modern American canon of sixty six that correlate to these characters being mentioned at the in the fifth verse of chapter one of the book of Enoch. Yeah. So right out the gate, we're given some context of who these players are, who's involved in this idea, and the watchers are quaking. So that doesn't look like they're. That's not. It doesn't seem to be a good thing because it says great fear and trembling seize them unto the ends of the earth. Um, so that seems definitely to be, you know, it's not a, they're not quaking out of respect. They're quaking out of fear. That's uh, right. And then also in verse six, the high mountains are shaken, the high hills made low and shall melt like wax before the flame. Um, this is what we're going to see over in Isaiah chapter 40. Um, and this is what Isaiah talks about. I think it's uh, chapter 40. Let me jump to it real quick. And I'm going to put yeah, this. Yeah, it's. Green it's in Isaiah. It's, it's in a lot of different. The minor prophets talk about it too. How huh? it actually um, yeah, it is. It's in Nahum one four. It's yeah. in um, Zechariah one eight, I believe, or it's Psalm ninety seven eight. Yeah, it Joel. Is. Joel actually talks about it in a fascinating way. Right. How the angels are essentially his army, and they're going to just tear through the earth and like climb into windows and this and that. And you know, I know mm -hmm. commonly that that specific chapter gets. Um, interpreted as being like us we're the army of god right we're the joel army and it's yeah. contextually not so not so now, if people i mean i just want to lovingly share with people if if you heard a pastor out there telling you that you are part of the joel army that you're metaphorically prophetically being raised up in this day in this generation to be a part of the joel army they i would strongly encourage them to really research the context of the joel army those are angels coming yeah. back on the day of the lord to clear out the area so that the new jerusalem can sit down so there and this is what is expressed to us in matthew matthew 13 as well um and this is you know that you're as a red rescue saint you're not coming back to do a battle you're hidden away um so you can uh, be ready get ready for the wedding supper of the lamb um so that you can go into covenant with the land of promise and so you're not coming to do battle but this particular verse in enoch 1 verse 5 where it's talking about Excuse me, verse six, where it's talking about the mountains being shaken and made low. We, if anyone's trying to compare and research this, we see this paralleled in Isaiah 40, verse four. Actually, we can start with the verse three, where it talks about a voice calling, clear the way the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. Let the rough ground become a plain. Let the rugged terrain become a broad valley. And then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And, um, so this is why John the Baptist is actually quoting this as well. So right, for right from the get-go, um, and this, and that's actually in, uh, I believe it's in John uh, or Luke chapter three. And then um, let me see if I can find it just real quick. Uh, Ken, if you'll give me just yeah, that. Sean, while you're looking for that, um, I think it's incumbent upon the viewer to know that this, like all this being described, all this melting of wax before the face of Yahweh and the mountains, you know, melting and the valleys being made high and all that. Um, that sounds a lot like a new heavens and new earth type of environment, right? I used to believe years ago, um, before we had met actually, that the new heavens and the new earth were at the end of the thousand year millennial reign. But contextually, I had to, you know, as I understood things a little bit better, because the day of the Lord is one of the, it is the most important, in my opinion, um, theme within the scripture to really comprehend um, that this new heavens and new earth is at the front end of the millennial reign. And so this is what we're seeing here being described when, when Yeshua it comes down with his myriads of angels to decimate the nations that have come up and gathered themselves against him is that along the way, all these mountains are coming down, valleys are being raised and things are, like, you know, the firmament is peeled back, as you've said very nicely. Um, that to me is a new heavens and a new earth starting there, not at the end of the millennial reign. Yes, absolutely. And this is where people get tripped up because they think Revelation 20 and 21 are chronological. Um, but Revelation, just like the book of Genesis, will make a statement, skip to the end of the story in summary fashion, and then back up in the next chapter and give you more detail of what it just referenced in the previous chapter. It's called expounding <laughs> on a topic. Yeah. And so um, this is just a literary version, way of writing. This is uh, Lots of authors do this. We see this in movies all the time where they glimpse a preview of something and they back up and they go in depth with that character and with that scene to further expound all the details for you. So once you then see that summary again, 
you actually have the full context and it makes sense. So it's a, a quick um, foreshadowing, they back up, they expound, they give you depth of context, and then you can go back to that image or that thought and you can appreciate it. And that's why you're teased with it with the foreshadowing um, in the summary version. And that the Bible does that often. Very often. Genesis and Revelation does that a lot too. But and uh, it, that's, in, that's encapsulated beautifully in my favorite show, Lost. Like J.J. Yeah. Abrams did an amazing job doing exactly what you just described. If, if for those who you know want to see a visual of that, it's they did a really good job in that show of doing that. I think they're one of the first to actually do that kind of you know back and forth foreshadowing and then going back type of thing. Yeah, but yeah, it's in the scriptures. That's it's not a as you said, it's not a chronological linear thing as most people t teach in Revelation and and some of the prophets as well. Like it's it jumps around and you have to discern that. That's right. Yeah. Imagine coming home to your wife and you're, and you're, she asked you, you know, how'd your day go? And you had a, you know, crazy conversation with your boss. Right. And you say, you know what? I had a crazy conversation with my boss. Um, I'm no longer employed there. She would be like, what, what kind of conversation was this? She would want you to back up and explain. So this, we see this in scripture where it says that it'll say descriptions over huge, big events with many characters involved give you the end, and then it backs up and explains the details of a certain facet of that story in great detail. So that's what we're seeing in Revelation 20 and 21, where it, it gives us a quick overview of Satan being locked away, the day of the Lord's happening, everything's being, you know, uh, Yeshua shows up and takes over and stamps out the wicked. Um, it gives us a quick understanding of this is the first resurrection that happened, and those who take part in that, in that moment, on that day, were blessed, and then it goes all the way down after the thousand years, to when Satan's released, then into the great white throne judgment. So in Revelation 20, it skips all the way through to the end of the thousand years. In Revelation 21, it backs up to explain to you the, the beloved city that's attacked at the end of the thousand years, which is the New Jerusalem that he brought down. Um, now, of course, all the prophets before John, before the book of Revelation, they called the New Jerusalem Zion. And that's where, you know, and they have hundreds and hundreds of verses of description about Zion. And so that's why when, if we know the Old Testament and we study that, by the time we get to Revelation chapter 21, it ain't no thing. You already know what it's talking about. And you're like, and it's not even a problem. And you don't, there's no way to question the idea that, oh, this must be coming down at the end of the thousand years. No, no, it has to be down during the thousand years because it's integral to the storyline on, on where people are, are learning Torah, where people are coming to see the Messiah, who's called the Holy Great One, the, the glory of the Lord, so to speak. The salvation of God, all these idiomatic terms referring to the Messiah. And uh, and so that's why I'm just trying to go real quick. I was wanting to point out here in Enoch chapter one, near the very beginning, okay? And when it when we see references like this where it says that this moment on the day of the Lord where there's an incredible earthquake, as Revelation 16, verse 18 tells us, an earthquake so big that all the mountains are shaken into their valleys and the valleys are raised up. In Isaiah 25, it says that all the towers, it's the day that all the towers fall, right? So what towers could we possibly be talking about? Well, there's a lot of skyscrapers a lot, or across the world. So um, just a thought there. But it's um, it says that every city across the world is destroyed on this, in this amazing great earthquake. And all the mountains are brought low and they're smoothed out, so to speak, made level with the valleys. This Every time you see this in scripture, because it's in many different prophetic books, this is a direct reference to the day of the Lord when the Holy Great One shows up. We see Enoch is talking about it. It's parroted in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 and 4. And then in Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist is also talking about it. And the reason why I want to bring up John the Baptist is because of what it describes him, what it calls that after he's done talking about that. Okay, so in, in Luke chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, he's parroting Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 and 4. He's talking about the ravines are filled, the mountains brought low, the crooked will become straight, all flesh will see the salvation of God. But if you skip down in Luke chapter 3, just a couple verses, after he's talking about, um, you know, some of the soldiers came and questioned him about different things. And then in verse 15, it says, Now while the people were in a state of expectation, and all were wondering in their hearts about John, as to whether he was the Christ. John answered them and said to them, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and not fit to untie the thongs of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor, 
to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So this is another, just like Matthew 13, this is another reference to the day of the Lord where he comes back to clear the threshing floor, which is the foundation area that the New Jerusalem sets down on. He gathers the wheat into his barn. That's the resurrected saints being gathered into the New Jerusalem. And he burns up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's those who are within the boundaries of the New Jerusalem that refuse to leave and that are trying to fight him in the Valley of Armageddon and other places that he and the angels have to take out. And they're thrown into the lake of fire and extinguished from existence. But the very next verse, verse 18, it says, so with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. Okay? <clears throat> so everything he just talked about, the valleys being made low, massive earthquake, the angels coming, clearing out the wicked from the land, the resurrection of the dead of Christ, this is being called the gospel. And this is what Jesus talks about everywhere in the, New in the gospel accounts. Jesus is referring to this event and the sequence of events as the gospel of the kingdom of God. It's when the Messiah comes, the king comes with his kingdom. It's the gospel of the kingdom of God. So in the book of Enoch, chapter 1, verse 5 and 6 and 7, we have the gospel of the kingdom of God, guys. <clears throat> this is the same thing that Yeshua and all the prophets preached. It's the gospel of the kingdom of God. Right, right up front, right in the beginning. Yeah, amen, man. And that's, um, that's actually expounded quite a bit in a lot of other extra biblical texts that we hopefully will get to. Um, first Burak, second Burak, um, second Ezra, a lot of those descriptions that you were just beautifully laid out there are in these books. And it makes you wonder, you know, why they were moved. They have, they're just rife with so many um, yeah. of these descriptions that are in the canon, right? But I think, Sean, one of the things that really throws people off with this timeline and the millennial reign and the whole new heavens and earth when that starts is, if I'm not mistaken, Judaism teaches that the Messiah will come and essentially walk into the Jerusalem that's there now, or that's, you know what I mean? That's a physical terrestrial building, and he'll come walking into that. And so... They teach a much more, um, um, you know, much more along the idea that he's just a, a strong political leader that's going to come back and, and create peace and take over and be able to come in, you know, with signs and wonders, um, to physically take over. I'm, I honestly never even heard anyone from Judaism explain how the the Messiah that they think is coming, you know, and all the explanations of him and the prophets, how he's going to be a priest. And so that's a big deal that they never talk about. Um, but this could also be, Ken, why we see in the book of Revelation where it says, you know, the beast um, deceives people with all versions of lying signs and wonders, even as much as fire falling down from heaven, calling down fire from heaven, right? Yeah. Which would, which was something we see the priests do in the Old Testament with burnt offerings on special occasions as a great sign of wonder, right? Elijah is one of those, right? So um, in First uh, Kings 17 and 18, I believe. So that could be how he's going to deceive both the Jews and Islam. Um, as far as an antichrist character and why the whole world wonders after him, you know. Um, but personally, I don't, I don't know if that's true. That's just speculation. So, I think it's a good conjecture for sure. I had actually a question before we move on there, Sean. Um, verse three, how we said concerning the Holy Great One will come forth, or sorry, the Holy Great One will come forth from His dwelling, and we're, you know, we're we're thinking that's Yeshua. But then in verse four, and the eternal God will tread upon the earth, even on Mount Sinai. Now, is this, is this Yahweh, the eternal God, coming down on Mount Sinai on that day, or is this Yeshua through the agency of his Father doing this? That's why I was saying that, you know, we get all this wonderful extra context. If we just take that verse alone, we may think that there is no Messiah, that it's just the Father himself, right? But thankfully, Enoch itself is going to give us a great wealth of context about who is fulfilling this actual action. So God always gets the credit, right? If an angel shows up and gives a message to Mary and Joseph that they're going to have a son who's going to be the light of the world, like the Gentiles, Savior of mankind, did the angel get the credit for that message? Of course not, right? No, yeah, no. Yeah, the father gets the credit. Yeah. When Elijah opens the eyes of that king so he can see the angelic armies around him and gives strength and encouragement to that king, does Elijah get the credit for instilling faith in that man 
Or does that man praise God? Does that man praise Elijah? Or does he praise God for allowing Elijah to work through the power of God to do that, right? When Jesus was healing people all throughout the Gospels, yes, they praised him. But Jesus said, well, look, you know, the Father is greater, right? And they would praise God after miraculous things were done because of the Messiah, because they knew, in my opinion, they knew books like Enoch, which we're going to read in later chapters in great detail. It talks about how the Father sends his Son in his power and authority to do these things, and that's why he's viewed as God, right? That's why he's called the Holy Great One. That's why he can say the eternal God. And even if you want to, if you want, we wanted to play semantics with this phrase, and if we wanted to be a strict literal reading of the phrase, the eternal God will tread upon the earth. Well, we know that Yeshua is raised perfect, incorruptible in his resurrection body, and he's going to live forever, right? So he's going to be the eternal God anyway. That's why, you know, in Psalm 45, 6 and 7, Yahweh call, calls the Messiah God because he's walking in the agency and the fullness of the Father, um, which yeah. is why we get So, Sean, Sean, to throw a little twist in here, um, so like Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 37, where it says that, like, Yahweh will be with his people on that day. Right. Now, is he, the way I kind of envision this, and I could be wrong, is that Yahweh, when he kicks off this great and terrible day at the last trumpet, he kind of pushes Yeshua out with the angels, and they go down and they, they do their job, right? They just demolish and they clean things up. And he kind of descends with them afterwards and tabernacles among them. So how does that, like him tabernacling among men, is he actually doing that, like literally on this earth, or is he still in his well, that would, mighty throne in the heavens? Like, could this not be referring to him in uh, Enoch here, him and Yeshua? That would be, um, again, there's many places in Scripture where it quickly references an action happening and then the credit going to the Father or the Almighty. Um, but once you dig into the details of actually who's carrying that out versus who's getting the, the uh, end credit, now, as far as tabernacle, you know, God tabernacles among men, he does that, yes. And that's actually, we see that in Enoch 105, uh, 105th chapter, where in verse 2 he says, you know, my, uh, for I and my son will be united with him forever and pass of brightness in their lives. So that's a big statement where he's talking about we will come down to them. Where I would give you a, um, a literal geographical answer to your question would be the, the layout of the New Jerusalem, of Zion itself. So we're given the dimensions in Revelation 21. It was 1,500 miles squared and 1,500 miles tall. That's a big place. The Most High, the God the Father, on the top. is on the top. Okay, but right? he's, he's under the firmament, is what I'm asking. He's well, he, that's, when he that's, peels that back and he descends with the New Jerusalem. He's so, sitting as the Most High on top of Zion in right. the New Jerusalem, but on our plane, right? Or not? I think the two are connected, honestly, because of the New Jerusalem, because that's why it's coming down through the firmament, and it can, it sets down on the earth, and I think it's connecting the heavenly realm above the firmament with the one on the ground. That's why it's so tall, and that's why he can dwell among us like he did in the garden. We have access to the Father. Psalm 15, who can ascend his holy hill? He who is righteous, blameless, right? Those who that are resurrected get to ascend the holy hill. Even apparently, as we're going to read in Enoch 15, the Almighty dwells in unapproachable light so he has to have someone that can be his his visual res, re, representation that's why we get these passages like colossians 1 and, and uh, romans excuse me uh hebrews chapter 1 where he talks about yeshua jesus the messiah is the representative of the father he is the express image of him he is the perfect representative so that we can see what god looks like in in walking talking form okay that john I, i'm gonna sorry i'm gonna quote something real quick here at a second barrack is that just triggered my mind to go to this, what you're just describing here. And I think it might make sense and might apply. Real, real quick, Ken, just in case those who don't know are unaware, where do you, what book is it you're about to read from? What's going on there? Yeah, this is Second Baruch. This is um, Baruch, is, uh, who is Jeremiah's scribe. He had written a couple books as well that I believe are worth investigating into as well. But um, just in light of what we're talking about, about how... You think that the, the kind of the heavens, the firmament, are kind of all attached to the New Jerusalem in a way that Yahweh's on the top, and and so he's yes, he's kind of physically in our realm, but he's still at the Most High on the top here. Um, in the fifty-first chapter of this second Baruch, it says that 
and this is referring to us in our resurrected bodies, for they shall behold the world which is now invisible to them, and they shall behold the time which is now hidden from them, and time shall no longer age them. For in the heights of that world shall they dwell, and they shall be made like unto the angels, and be made equal to the stars. And they shall be changed into every form they desire, from beauty into loveliness, and from light into the splendor of glory. For there shall be spread before them the extents of paradise, and there shall be shown to them the beauty of the majesty of the living creatures which are beneath the throne, and all the armies of the angels who are now held fast by my word, lest they should appear, and are held fast by a command, that they may stand in their places till their advent comes. So to me, this kind of sounds like, in our resurrected immortal bodies, the type that we're going to be getting just like Yeshua's, and we're going to be able to kind of reach the extents of this, you know, New Jerusalem, which is, like you said, 1,500 miles square and equally as high, we're going to be up quite high or have the capability of reaching the heights. Yeah. I, if this is correct. Yes. As far as the dimensions go, right? Up, up, right, left, right, down, B, A, B, start, start. No, sorry. That's an old Nintendo joke. <laughs> but as far as the, for, for any of you Contra players from NES back in the 80s, you know what that's all about. But as far as up, down, left, right, in the New Jerusalem, fathers at the top, we get these resurrected bodies. Yeshua himself exemplified the capabilities of our resurrected bodies. And he, standing with the disciples at the end of Matthew 28 and, and Acts chapter 1, he ascended just like, you know, like nothing, like anti-gravity, right? Um, or maybe I should say anti-electromagnetism working <laughs> and density. But that's a different conversation. Come on, biblical creation model here, Sean. Let's yeah, go. Right. So let's. So the idea is that he ascended right in the presence, and they, you know, just up into the clouds. The angels showed up, and they're like, "Hey, he's gone. You can stop looking now." You know, and it's he's just showing them, look, and and that's we're gonna get that same body. So if the Father's on top of Mount Zion at the very top, it's no problem for us. I mean, we'll be able to get up there just like the angels do. We'll be able to move around, and in fact, according to Baruch. We're actually going to be made greater than the angels, which sets a whole other topic, whole other show. Yeah. Uh, it's exciting, man. I don't know. I, I don't know how this can't excite you. You know, like <laughs> we don't hear about these things being taught behind pulpits. No offense to those who may be watching that teach behind pulpits and whatnot. And you may do that. That's awesome. But from my, my experience, I haven't heard anything that would make me instill joy within me, just such a joy and a hope for what's to come and like these promises that we're going to receive and inherit. It's just, that increases faith when you understand just what we're going to be given. It's amazing. It makes you really, really, really excited for it. It makes me at least. <laughs> Absolutely, man. That's why, you know, Hebrews 11 calls it being made perfect. And that's a big, that's a big statement. We are, we're made perfect at the resurrection. So, and that's why it's called the hope of glory. You know, the resurrection of the saints of Christ is referred to as the hope of glory. Okay, Sean, also in um, it's a verse 5 here where it says, and the watchers shall quake you know, on this great and terrible day of the Lord when all this stuff is taking place. The watchers quaking. Where are they that they'd be quaking? Where are they experiencing this quake from? From my understanding, as we move forward through Enoch, it's, they get in prison for some of the things that they do. Do you agree that it's from their place of imprisonment that they're quaking? Or do we have other angels kind of running around on the earth that... Well, this this becomes into the you know the discussion of who Azazel is, and where does Enoch tell us when does Enoch tell us he gets his comeuppance and he gets his judgment? Um, I think this is going to be an, an interesting study because you and I actually disagree on this one. Unless things have changed, um, you and I disagree because I think Azazel is the Satan character being referred to in the Canon of sixty six, who's who's bound in chains in Revelation nineteen and put away. For a thousand years, um, and I, if I'm not mistaken, you think that he's already been judged? Yeah, well, just the way that I understand the text, it seems like he's under the earth, and that's the whole point of Leviticus, I believe it was 16, where the um, the scapegoat, whatever goes out to Azazel, it's kind of like it's pushed out to where he is in in the desert, and to me, it sounds like he's imprisoned during that time, and you know, we hear that the devil is around on the earth. Um, Specifically in Job, he's able to access the Father, um, and we're told that he's like a roaring lion, so he can people to de devour right and on the earth. So it, it seems like that person or that entity or adversary is able to roam freely on the earth, whereas Azazel seemed like he was imprisoned um, 
earlier on in the, in the uh, pre-flood days. Yes. Yeah, it seems, it seems like that. And that's why um, we're going to read some fascinating things once we get to chapter 60 and 62. Um, but, but we'll just, we'll wait till we get there. Because- yeah, we'll get there. And I'm, and I'm always willing to change perspectives, as you know, I mean, that's what we have to do. If we want to know the truth, we'd be willing to test these things, which we're doing and humble ourselves and be willing to be te- teachable. And during this, yeah. during the study, we may come to find out, I may come to find out that my uh, speculation is wrong and that Azazel has already been judged this particular guy. And that the Satan being referred to in the canon of 66 is someone altogether different. And that would be awesome if we did find that information. Um, so that's what we're going to figure out as we study this book. Amen. But, I heard, say this, as far as um, the idea of angels being imprisoned, this is, we're going to read about that in Enoch 22 and some other places um, about the types of imprisonment. Now, regardless of who is in that imprisonment there's enoch uses different um expressions of language than some of the other books that we're used to okay so enoch is and that's what we're gonna we're gonna thoroughly dissect when we get to these places but enoch will many times and i don't know if it's just because we only have a few translations of it and there hasn't been as much scrutiny and scholarship into the book of Enoch as we have into the modern canon of 66 and all those books. Um, but there's a couple places in Enoch where the translation seems to say that something is happening forever. And that's, but there's extra context telling us that that's not happening forever, but that, that term forever is being used for a, a period of time until, until that um, judgment is done. If that makes sense. Yeah, so, it does. And that, that goes into the, um, I guess the research, researching the word Olam, right? The, it's, you know, yeah. there's different segments and periods involved with that word. It doesn't have to mean eternally, like forever. Right. Even though the word forever may be used, it may not specifically be referring to that. Yeah, that's just our, our generic English translation, and we think it just means eternally. Yeah. You know, but it doesn't always. You have to look at the, all the greater context, and this will help you determine if that translation has been, you know, extremely accurate or if it's been fudged a little bit just because of its generic use, you know, because, you know, we've, even in the book of Jubilees in chapter 46, we get a mention of how Satan was locked away and not during the days of Joseph in Egypt and that he wasn't around, but that means he was let out afterwards. So there's a temporary judgment, just like we see a temporary judgment in Revelation 20 for Satan. So, um, and this is where we always, we've had this conversation in other episodes, right? This Satan character, whoever he is, uh, apparently, he is the ultimate lawyer. He's the ult- he knows the legal loopholes to, to get punished enough, but not not the kind of punishment we're going to read about from these other watchers who yeah. listen to him, right? So, Sean, I already know where you're going with this argument. No, I'm just saying. I'm just saying that the the other watchers that are fearing and, sh- and quaking. Um, I'm just saying in terms of your Azazel theory. I get like uh-huh. you think that he was imprisoned for. A, forever where we would read it forever but it could be just a small segment of time and then he was let back out to, to roam the earth as the devil right actually no that's not even what i was, no. I was yeah just spoiler alert i was going to say that the uh the the cast uh, the judgment that's cast for azazel didn't actually happen during the days of enoch but it was proclaimed to him to be happening later we see okay. the fulfillment of that in revelation 19. okay all right we'll leave that we'll, we'll leave that for another day yeah, you, you, you piqued my interest big time on that one because I've been wanting to know who our adversaries are forever. I mean, it's important, right? You got to know your enemy, right? And I feel like, for the most part, we don't really comprehend who the enemy are is and who they are. Multiple enemies, right? Well, as we're gonna find out here in Enoch, um, that's why it mentions these watchers right off the right off the bat. Just like I said with Genesis Revelation, it mentions something, but then it's gonna go back and it's gonna expound in great detail later. So Enoch is doing that as well, right? In chapter one, it's mentioning the watchers are going to sh- will quake on the day of the Lord um, with the coming of the Messiah and His kingdom. But we're going to go back, and it's going to expound in following chapters. It's going to expound on who the watchers are and yeah. what they did that makes them the enemy. And um, so that's I'm excited to get to it. All right, I'll pick it back up here at verse eight here, Sean. But with the righteous, he will make peace, and and I'd say just an addendum to that, that the peace is in terms of the new covenant 
which is called the covenant of peace, an everlasting covenant. Right. Another discussion, perhaps, but we get to have peace involved on this great day, which is awesome. And we'll protect the elect, and mercy shall be upon them, and they shall all belong to God, and they shall be prospered, and they shall all be blessed. And he will help them all, and light shall appear unto them, and he will make peace with them. And behold, he cometh with 10,000. Oh, <clears throat> is this out of Jude? It sounds like out of Jude. Am I reading the wrong thing here, Sean? <laughs> right. And behold, yeah. he cometh with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to destroy all the ungodly. For those, sorry, I had to throw that in there. It's, it's a verbatim quote in Jude. I believe it's 116. Yeah, verse 6 in, in the book of the epistle of Jude. Or verse 6, rather, yeah. Yeah, because there's only one chapter in Jude, and that it's verse six. It's it's directly taken from from Enoch because Jude is quoting the book of Enoch. So, Amen. And to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. <laughs> Sean, we finished the chapter, buddy. Yeah, we did. I love how that last verse just drives home the word ungodly yeah <laughs> it's just it's great <laughs> um so yeah here we are right off the bat chapter one boom this message is for those leading up to the return of messiah in that generation in that day that day of tribulation um it talks about the the holy great one coming out of, of his camp uh to you know appearing in strength of might and how the enemy will be trembling with fear how the earth itself is going to be uh, changed because of the you know the uh, all the events that are happening um and then it talks about the resurrection which is talking about the you know the peace that is being made with the elect and the light that shall appear unto them we're going to read about that in other places how we become illumined at the resurrection just like jesus did at the transfiguration in luke 9. that's why we are like walking light bulbs or we can be in our resurrection bodies that's why we're called children of lights in ephesians right because why we can dwell in his presence right that's right there's unapproachable yeah. light for us right now so yeah that's that's why we we have the actual opportunity um that's that's and this is why we have proleptic statements in the new testament by paul that says we boldly approach the throne of grace right yeah we don't have to shake and quake and fear and all that stuff right, right? we can just saunter on into our father's yeah, throne of grace that's right which is you know un, yeah there's so many so many things there we could parallel with but right. we're going to see in enoch is is what i'm getting at is this the idea the language of the first resurrection is spoken about the the people that have participated in it are called the elect okay for people following along there it's often referred to as peace being made into them eternally we're going to read about this in chapter five of enoch even more um, and it goes into great detail about how we will be made in a way that we'll never be able to sin again. And so this is the peace given it to us. And it's also referred to as oil of gladness. And we see that in the prophets as well. Um, and so this is a, and this is the mercy that is shown to us is that we're saved from Sheol from this. We're not, we don't experience a second death. We're resurrected um, at the return of Messiah. And that is the mercy shown to us. Yeah. Yeah. So and that's the that's the salvation that's the salvation we look towards, right, Sean? It's being saved from what his wrath to come. We're going to be put into bodies that can withstand the wrath. That's right. That's what's cool about it is that so we, we don't. Yeah, we don't actually undergo the wrath, but we're put into new bodies that that will never be thrown into the lake of fire, and we'll never be able to transgress his law, so that we can we don't have to worry about the second death. We sorry. can enjoy peace with him, and and actually. He can, like, you know, John 17 says, Jesus says, you know, you, or excuse me, John 14, he says, you, you come and believe in me and keep my words, my father's words, you know, we will come and make our home with you. You know what I'm saying? We'll make our boat with you. And that's the promise. That only can happen if we have resurrected bodies. So that's Amen. part of the promise. It's amazing. Hey, Amen. You want to do chapter two there, Sean? Yeah, we'll do chapter two. It's a little bit shorter, but we'll maybe fly through two and three. Sure. Um, it says, observe ye everything that takes place in the heaven, how they do not change their orbits and the luminaries which are in the heaven, how they all rise and set in order each in its season, transgress not against their appointed order. Behold ye the earth, and give heed to the things which take place upon it from first to last, how steadfast they are, 
how none of the things upon earth change, but all the works of God appear to you. Behold the summer and the winter, how the whole earth is filled with water, and clouds and dew and rain lie upon it. That's, that's all of chapter 2. Um, chapter 3 kind of goes into some trees. Here's just one statement. It's very short in this translation. It says, Observe and see how in the winter all the trees seem as though they have withered and shed all their leaves, except 14 trees, which do not lose their foliage, but retain the old foliage from two or three years till the new comes. So I'm guessing he's referring to wintergreen trees. Yeah. Wintergreens. But if you go back to chapter 2. <clears throat> yeah, there's something interesting in there I wanted to point out, but you go ahead. I was just to say he's the the narrator is you know is trying to give the reader to make com you know just take an observation of the creation and how everything works continually as it was ordained in Genesis one you know the luminaries the sun moon and stars they're doing their circle in the firmament uh, their circuit as Psalm nineteen calls it you know um, and that they're steadfast it's not changing and that we can see these things how they're consistent you know yeah. go ahead what did you want to say. Oh, I was just going to point out that it says, um, observe how like the luminaries, which are on the heavens, they do not transgress their appointed order. And we're going to find out that that's a general statement, but isn't the truth for some of these luminaries, correct? Yeah, exactly. Just like in all of scripture, it makes one statement for purpose and intention of purpose, but then we see specifics come in, right? Just like Adam was made good, right? There was nothing... He didn't lack anything. He was good. But things changed. <laughs> That's where you read the further context, and then he becomes corrupted and fallen. You yeah. know, and so... And uh, for those, sorry, for those who may not know what I'm talking about, why I brought that up is because we're going to find out that some stars actually have transgressed their order, and they were in prison. We're going to find out um, where and their judgment. Yeah, and it even says, is it the Book of Jubilees? It talks about because of those stars transgressed their order. I think it's in chapter six that men were deceived on the earth. Yes. Yeah. I don't say that. Yeah. So that's that's a big deal, you know, that they transgressed. <clears throat> because we're told, like the stars, the sun, the moon, the heavenly bodies are for keeping seasons and times and and you know feast days and all that stuff. And so if they're not doing their thing and they're transgressing that, it, it could has the potential to thwart our understanding of those things that they were created for, right? So I'm, I'm just guessing that that would, would mean that even those luminaries and that class of angel, that class of heavenly being, seems to have his own uh, free will, huh? Yeah, it sounds like they're not just these gaseous stars that um, aren't sentient and serve really no random purpose. It's, it sounds like they're purposeful and they have a specific order that they're not supposed to transgress and they can transgress it, which implies sentience in a way. Now, of course, you know, we would we would probably have people that would say, well, you know, it could have just been a meteorite hit something, and you know, stars collide, right? Stars collide, change their orbit, and so that's what it's talking about. But that's not what the context of Enoch is claiming. It's claiming that these things were set in motion. Genesis one says the stars were put in the firmament, um, and that Enoch chapter two here is saying that these these things which are in the heaven. By the way, the word heaven is defined for us in Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. And it's called the firmament, right? It's a hard structure placed over the earth that holds the water above it, as Psalm 148.4 expands to us in many other places. Um, that, you know, that this firmament within the firmament, and I know that people have different interpretations. They think that, <coughs> excuse me, they think that in a biblical creation model, that the firmament, when it says the sun, moon, and stars are placed in the firmament, they think it means under the barrier of the firmament. But I would contend from lots of context that the sun, moon, and stars are placed in the layers of the firmament. And we're actually going to read later in the book of Enoch where it's which layer it says the sun sits in which layer of the firmament. So it's not under the firmament in our immediate cloud system that it says it's up in the firmament. And that there's, so it's very interesting. Um, and apparently these things are following the circuits that are intended to them so that we see the night sky as we see it in the daytime movement of the sun and moon as we see them. And that these are not to, these are appointed to move like that and to be consistent and steadfast like the chapter says. Not to change just because there's chaos in a random solar system where things are bumping into each other from a Big Bang explosion billions of years ago. That is not what the Bible describes. That is not the creation model that Enoch describes either. And so Enoch is saying these things were put there intentionally, 
And then later when we read how some of the luminaries transgress their, their ordained orders, um, it's not because stars are colliding randomly with a bunch of rocks in space. It's very intentional and it's part of the storyline. So uh, just so people have an under understanding here, Enoch is right off the chapter two, right off the bat. It's just showing a, we're dealing with a biblical creation model where everything was placed intentionally and on purpose. And all that's going to come into play throughout this story, just like Genesis 1 gives us a biblical creation model, which lines up with Enoch's creation model. And all those, all that context plays throughout the rest of the story for our benefit and for edification. Yeah, and this, I agree 100%, Sean. And this is not in any way referring to laws of accommodation and, you know, Enoch pandering to the cultures around him and their understanding of the cosmological environment that they lived in, right? This is what he experienced, and we can take it literally. Right. Right. So, yeah, I've heard that, that doctrine of accommodation before. Um, and for those who are unfamiliar with that, just in short, all it says is that what it claims or what the, you know, the, the doctrine supposes is that um, God gave us a description of the creation that is not accurate because he didn't think the people that he was talking to could understand it. And so he gave them a, a different description of creation and but it really wasn't accurate and they don't really discuss the idea of you know god being truthful or not but just <laughs> but yeah. just the idea that but now because you know in modern times we have technology and nasa has told us what the creation really looks like and so therefore we know god must have just been telling them a version that they could understand at the time and i'm just like guys i just want to encourage people to believe your Bible, just believe what it says. The moment you start saying, well, I know it says this, but is it really saying something else? And maybe God was just throwing that out there. I mean, that's that's where all kinds of tripping up happens. Absolutely. Lots of tripping, lots of deception, lots of making you question whether or not you can take God's word as literal and faith, with face value, or if you have to somehow say, hey, like, um, obviously this can't be true because I'm going to believe what men say about this. So I think the purpose of the whole deception with the biblical creation model is to get us questioning more and more. Uh, can I put my faith and trust in these words? Yeah. And unfortunately, our adversaries in all the forms that they come have done a really successful job. Yeah. Every, everything that scripture tells us, you know, every different component, um, every working part in the big story, the enemy has tried to redefine and get us to not believe those components of the story so that it brings confusion. Yeah. All right, Sean, you want to move on to <laughs> chapter four, unless you want to expound on some trees in chapter yeah, three? I, I don't have a lot to add on chapter three. It's very unique. Um, so I'll just start with chapter four. And yeah. again, observe you the days of summer, how the sun is above the earth. Uh, what did it say? Above the earth? Okay, yeah. So, observe ye the days of summer, how the sun is above the earth, over against it. And you seek shade and shelter by reason of the heat of the sun. And the earth also burns with growing heat. And so you cannot tread on the earth or in a rock by reason of its heat. So this just is like basic observation of sun's out, things get hot. You know, bring your sandals. <laughs> That's what I was thinking when I read this. Actually, another version that I uh, read that one in makes it sound like from the perspective it's the angels that are looking down and they observe like our environment on the earth and essentially it makes it sound like um you know we can't tread on these hot rocks like i think about my experience at the beach some days where you're like trying to get across the sand and you're like oh and you gotta like run to the ocean to pull your feet out because they're burning it's it's kind of funny how they describe it here because <laughs> i've experienced that i can't i can't walk around sand for too long yeah <clears throat> so if in the days of Enoch, which was about 700 years before the flood, which according to the biblical timeline and calendar to up to our modern day, puts us roughly about, you know, 5,200 years ago, 5,100 years ago would be the days of Enoch. That means that 5,100 years ago, the sun still came out and there were still hot summer days and that things still got hot. So I'm not sure there's been, you know, a lot of global warming happening. Greenhouse gases didn't exist. I'm being, I'm being silly, but yeah, exactly right. Where are these greenhouse gases? Can you imagine if 
can you imagine if modern day scientists truly, <laughs> truly looked at, um, you know, the biblical creation model and then started talking about greenhouse gases? Because we're dealing with a huge terrarium, right? You're dealing with a big greenhouse. And uh, it's just hilarious to me. They would, you know, they would, no wonder they reject it with mockery, scorn, and, you know, outright anger because um, that would just prove to them even more so that they have no clue what they're talking about and that they're just posturing with all these different theories that many times contradict themselves in modern day scientific uh, realms because they would have to then try to figure out how we can have a sun that shines down in a firmament enclosed creation and uh, doesn't cook us all. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just like, <clears throat> and for those watching, I'm, I'm in no way saying that there aren't catastrophic, catastrophic events, um, geological events happening on the earth. You know, the, there's stuff happening on the earth. It's just the narrative behind it. I don't agree with because the scriptures from pretty much the start to the finish talk about our earth as being a living system that got corrupted through sin and through the angels and through all these things. And the earth is a system that's moaning and groaning and yearning for its redemption on the day of the Lord. And so it's, it's experiencing all these things from our sin, from all the blood being poured out onto the earth. And, and what I'm saying is, Sean, these weather patterns, they've been happening pretty much since the beginning. And it's, yeah. it, it's a birthing process, right? It's likened to, you know, the womb of the earth. It's waiting to give birth to the departed spirits, us who are in Sheol waiting for the first resurrection. And along the way, she's having pains, right? And so the earth is experiencing things that we do to it. Yes, we do damage it in a massive way, but it's the whole global warming narrative that I'm just trying to say that I, I deny fully, and I know you do as well. And it's, it is a biblical concept for it to be experiencing catastrophic events and stuff like that. And it will be even more so in days ahead, but it's not global warming. It's not because we're on a ball confined in this thing and it, what we just described essentially. Well, what you're referring to is those who destroy the earth. And that's something that um, <clears throat> Revelation 11 talks about how, you know, I think it's in verse uh, 15. I think it's verse 15 where it starts talking about how now is the kingdom of God. And it's the, it's the last trumpet has been blown and the Messiah is on his way. And it talks, let me just read it real quick because it, it um, adds to what you're talking about and even goes back to Genesis 6. And has to do with the watchers as we're about as we just were introduced to right in the book of Enoch and it's about destroying the earth and so uh, Revelation 11 is where I'll start I'll jump back to Genesis 6 and then I'll, I'll we'll keep going but <clears throat> it's a uh, verse 15 the seventh angel sounded and there was loud voices in heaven saying the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever and the 24 elders who sat on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worship God saying we give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power, and you have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came. And the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great. And here's the kicker. And to destroy those who destroy the earth. So there is an intentional effort to destroy the earth. And this is what I don't think a lot of people realize. So we see this paralleled in Genesis as well. Okay. Genesis chapter six, I believe it's verse 11 or 13, um, where it talks about, I'm going to read it real quick. Uh, yeah. 11. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God and the earth was filled with violence. You see what I mean? Yes. And I know people, I know a lot of people would be like, um, uh, oh, he's just talking about, you know, he's just talking about the people inhabiting the land. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're just sinning and they're doing this and that. Right. And it's not actually anything to do with the, the, the place that they're standing on. Right. But we yeah. see that we see that ex, that idea expounded upon in Genesis 7, verse 11, where it talks about the fountains of the great deep burst open. Right? And so we're talking about violent earthquakes. We're talking about reshifting of land. Um, this is where we've got, you know, that's why... The only safe place there could have been. You got water pouring in from the firmament above, massive earthquakes with huge, you know, land shifting below. The only safe place there could have been was to be insulated in a a pressure resistant body of water floating on top of it. 
right? Yeah. While all the chaos and drama is happening around you, the water itself protected the, the ark, and people don't realize that from all the chaos that was happening to the land itself. So <clears throat> the point is, that's why you're making statements about uh, Romans chapter 8, how the creation itself groans for the revelation of the sons of God, which is referencing the first resurrection. Uh, because when Yeshua comes back, he actually heals the earth. And this is talked about in Joel chapter 3, um, many, many other places in Psalms, I think Psalm 47. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> he tried to establish this with Israel, right? And, and their land is you let the land rest after 70 years, right? You give them the, its Sabbath so that it can rejuvenate because it's a living organism. You, yeah. right? And they didn't do that. They didn't let the land do that. Right, which is why he tells them in Second Chronicles, you know, 14, the famous passage, that if you would turn from your wicked ways, right, you would humble yourselves, seek my face, I will heal your land. Literally. Literally. So the yeah. behavior, whether righteous behavior or bad behavior, is always connected to the land because we came forth from the land. So, and we live on the land and we interact with the land. So the earth itself is being destroyed by bad behavior that God calls unrighteous. So whenever the resurrection happens, the new Jerusalem descends and we have, you know, millions, if not billion uh, of resurrected saints living in the new Jerusalem, teaching ways of good behavior to all the survivors outside the new Jerusalem and the water of life healing all the streams as Ezekiel 47 says, water of life comes from the new Jerusalem to heal all the land that was destroyed previously outside of the new Jerusalem. And you're getting things to have a chance to regrow and re retake time to have a big Sabbath, right? That Sabbath rest it needed in the land itself. And so this righteous behavior allows for us to heal the land that we live on. So if you're an, um, you know, a huge environmentalist, you should love the gospel of the kingdom of God. Amen. And if you've never heard the gospel of the kingdom of God, that's all throughout the Bible. I encourage you that for some people, that may be your turning point to believing in God and the Messiah and the coming hope that we have in the gospel of the kingdom of God. Because if you if you love the earth so much, you know what I'm saying, to the point where you're um, it's controlling the narrative you have with your family and friends, and it's become a political movement for you, you know, and you um, and you think that this is the great injustice that is happening in our time, be excited. Be be overjoyed that the gospel of the kingdom of God, that God hears your heart for that. And he shares that heart because he's going to heal the land when he returns. That's right. So, and I had, sorry, I had said uh, something before that was kind of correct. In Leviticus 25, four says, but in the seventh year, the land is to have a year of Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. And um, so it's every seven years, right, Sean, that they were, they were to let the land kind of lay fallow. And, yeah. And this number seven is interesting, right? We know that numbers are significant and he likes to use numbers to kind of ingrain in us to get us prepared for the seventh day which is our coming millennial 1000 year reign right where the land is completely replenished made new and it's in a sabbath rest that's right cool man where are we at here you want to keep going just think about that real quick okay there's a lot of people that theorize that you know the earth was created just under six thousand years ago and that uh, every all of Genesis one happened just under six thousand years ago, and that that the millennial reign is called our Sabbath rest in Hebrews four, um, and so that we have this idea that God's coming back, and for all of creation, people and and land, He's imposing a Sabbath rest for everyone to just chill, just chill. That's right, and Yeshua says that He is the Lord of the Sabbath, and he, that's what He's referring to. Right? It's that rain during that millennial Sabbath rest. It's yeah. not some whimsical, oh, he's the Lord of the Sabbath right now. I don't have to worry about commandment number four, which tells us to remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy while we're in this body of flesh and we can still do the commandments, right? Right, exactly. <clears throat> so if you didn't understand the gospel of the kingdom of God, you see Yeshua make a statement like that and you don't have a clue what he's saying, so you have to reinterpret it. You know? That's right. You don't know the context. So that's where it's wonderful that, you know, we have this context layered throughout. And it's being um, venerated with Enoch as well. So we got chapter 5 next. Observe ye how the trees cover themselves with green leaves and bear fruit. Wherefore, give ye heed and know with regard to all his works, and recognize how he that liveth forever hath made them so. And all his works go on thus 
from year to year forever and all the tasks which they accomplish for him and their tasks change not but according as God hath ordained so it is done and behold how the sea and the rivers in like manner accomplish and change not their tasks from his commandments but ye ye have not been steadfast nor done the commandments of the Lord but ye have turned away and spoken proud and hard words with your impure mouth against his greatness. O oh, you hard-hearted, you shall find no peace. Therefore shall you execrate your days, and the years of your life shall perish, and the years of your destruction shall be multiplied in eternal execration, and you shall find no mercy. In those days you shall make your names an eternal execration unto all the righteous, and by you shall all who curse curse, and all the sinners and godless shall impecrate by you. And for you, the godless, there shall be a curse. Lots of curses, guys, for those who aren't keeping the commandments and uh, all these things that were just mentioned. And all the dot, dot, dot shall rejoice. I'm not sure what word were there. I guess the righteous. And there shall be forgiveness of sins. That's when sins are forgiven, which is an interesting um, thing to say here. And there shall be forgiveness of sins in reference to once again, that the great day of the Lord when we're put into resurrected bodies and we're literally forgiven of our sins and they're remembered no more. So you remember that part in Revelation where um, I think it's chapter five. It says the angels bring the bowl before the Lord, which is the prayers of the saints. Yes. You know, in First John 1, 9, you know, Jesus is our high priest, right? The Chalcedic order, eternal high priest. And First John 1, 9 says that we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So <clears throat> this is where I've said before that I theorize and because of statements like this in Enoch and many other places in Hebrews and, and Revelation and just the whole concept of the priesthood in general and of the resurrection, I theorize that on the day the Lord is when, when he says our name before the Father, he's made atonement for us eternally and he's going to resurrect us into our eternal incorruptible bodies. And so when he's... That's the day when all these prayers are stored up for forgiveness, right? Our confessions and our asking for forgiveness of sins to our priest. And he brings them before the Father. He makes atonement for us eternally. He resurrects us. No other, no other. And, and in that moment, he resurrects us so that there's no other sin that could take place, right? For those living, right? Because even those, you know, the dead in Christ rise first, but then those who are alive and remain are also changed in the twinkling of an eye. Um, and on the on the great resurrection of, of the first resurrection of the day of the Lord. So <clears throat> it's in that moment that he's made atonement for us and he raises us to eternal life into this incorruptible, you know, goodly light of body that we cannot sin again, as we're about to read at the in verse eight and nine of this chapter. Yeah, amen. I, I agree with that hundred percent. And it's it's interesting that the prayers of the saints are stored in the bowl, right? And it's it sounds like it's kind of used as ammo. Right. Yeah, it's awesome. Where are we at here? Uh, verse 6 you were in? Yeah. And every mercy and peace and forbearance, there shall be salvation unto them, a goodly light. So that's, like we were talking about earlier, salvation literally will be on that day, given to us. And for all of you sinners, there shall be no salvation, but on you all shall abide a curse. But for the elect, there shall be light and joy and peace, and they shall inherit the earth. We've heard that one before, haven't we, Sean? Sounds like a beatitude to me. Yeah. And then there shall be bestowed upon the elect wisdom, and they shall all live and never again sin. That's amazing. That's such an amazing statement right there, a promise. The very thing that got us to where we're at today, we're not going to be capable of doing that anymore. Yeah. Either through ungodliness or through pride, but they who are wise shall be humble. And they shall not again transgress, nor shall they sin all the days of their life, nor shall they die of the divine anger or wrath, but they shall complete the number of the days of their life. And their lives shall be increased in peace, and the years of their joy shall be multiplied in eternal gladness and peace all the days of their life. That just, I don't know how that can get someone super pumped for <laughs> what's coming. And so here's a great example. When we're looking at the text or the, for the viewer, you know, when you're reading stuff and you see a statement that may confuse you, 
I encourage you to keep reading so you can find that context. This is kingdom in context, okay, guys? So the, the whole concept here, like in verse 9, um, it says, And they shall not tran again transgress, nor shall they sin all the days of their life. Now, if I stopped right there, I'd be like, okay. So that means that would lead me to think, well, all the days of their life, that would mean to think that, that there's an, a finite number of days to their life, right? And it says it again, nor shall they die of the divine anger or wrath, but they shall complete the number of the days of their life. And I would start to think, oh, well, this isn't talking about eternal life. This must be talking about just somehow in my regular life, I'll have joy and peace, right? But in the same verse, just a few, you know, just if I keep reading, and their life shall be increased in peace, and the years of their joy shall be multiplied in eternal gladness and peace all the days of their life. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so it's, it's, yeah it, it reads as though if there's a, an end point, right? And I have actually heard people speculate that, well, all we're going to get is the millennial reign, a thousand years, you know, one day that Adam, you know, accomplished and died under, we're going to get that. Well, that's not, that's, it's pretty good news to know that we would live at least for a thousand more years in an incorruptible body, but that's not the good news. We're going to live forever, along there being literally eternally forever. Right. John 3.16, right? Yeah. So he gives on begun silent that he should not believe in perish, but should have every eternal lasting life, that he should have eternal life. He doesn't have a caveat that says he should have eternal life for a thousand years, gentlemen, no and rain, yeah. but that he should have eternal life. And that's that's the whole point here is that you will live forever with God. Um and if you're not experiencing the second death, you're living forever. That's it. And a story, and it's in a state where you can never transgress again any of his commandments. Right. That's so weird. I can't, it's hard to wrap your mind around that, you know? And that's, uh, I think, sorry. I'm sorry. <clears throat> and to me, that's, that's what it's talking about in verse nine, when it says, nor shall they, they die of the divine anger or wrath. Two different concepts to die from. I think the divine anger is transgressing the law, the first death, and the wrath is the judgment um, where you're dying of the second death. Just throwing that out there. Yeah, I don't know. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I'm just I'm just speculating on that, but that's yeah. and so for those who use Jeremiah 31 about the law being circumcised on their hearts right now already, as if it's a literal application, it's it's nice to say that. And and as we pointed out before, Sean, it's what we're going through right now is a sanctification process, right? We're still we need to study, we need to know what the law of God is so that we don't transgress it because we are still in these bodies of flesh. We're gonna transgress. It can, it can lessen, right, as we right. become more and more like our Messiah and walk it out and understand these things. But the literal application of your heart being circumcised, according to Jeremiah 31, is on the day of the Lord when we won't do this, as Enoch already kind of elucidates right here. We won't literally transgress. That That's day. right. <clears throat> because we'll know the law. Because it's literally ingrained in us, and our thoughts and our actions will be walking, talking, Taurus. I mean, we'll know the law of God. So I love it when people say, oh, the law is written in your heart now. And I just want to ask them, okay, cool. Tell me what, uh, you know, Deuteronomy chapter five is. You know what I mean? And yep. they're like, what? So, okay, tell me what Numbers chapter six, is. The, the law in Numbers chapter six. Can you please express, tell me, tell me about that. And they can't, they can't tell you anything. Right, because they, they've been taught. And this is where I know people that know me might be sick of it already, but the whole new covenant thing. We're taught we're in the new covenant where the context of the new covenant means that the law is written on your heart. So people who are brought up in the church and are taught that your law, you have the circumcised heart, the laws, you're no longer under the law. So now you're in the spirit. But people, as you say, when you ask them, okay, well, if you have all these things on you, well, then can't, cite them all right now. And you're not doing any of those? Well, no, we're in the new covenant. We're, it's on our, no, that's, well, take it literally. Take it literally because that's what the context demands. <laughs> Well, and to take it, in my opinion, to take it a step more is what I've tried to do with some folks when they say, well, you know, the law is on my heart and that's the new covenant. And I'm like, well, for one, you don't know the law, so it's not on your heart. You, you, you just, you know, parts of it and you're doing your best to follow it. And that's wonderful. I, I applaud your desire to walk it out because that's called sanctification and discipleship. And that's amazing. And the Spirit's working in you to do that, to produce good fruit and good deeds Bless you for that. That's awesome. But this actual direct tie 
with the law being written on our heart is the first resurrection. That's the moment when we're given a heart that has it written on there, when we're given a new incorruptible body. The only reason we have corruptible bodies is because we transgressed the law. Yeah. So, Amen. Yeah. You know, that's, anyway, so I just, it's hard for me to understand. Once, it, once I came to that realization when I was studying the first resurrection and the whole concept of the law and the Torah, and I was like, oh, this is, this is hands down, this is easy. We're not in the new covenant. It's just because we don't have the law written on our heart yet. We're still learning it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And a lot of confusion also comes from people who think that they have the new spirit that Ezekiel talks about, right? Yeah. Yes. Those who are in covenant and walking and the father has called and shown the son and the son has shown the father in your life. You have the guaranteed deposit. You have the deposit the comforter in your life. You have that small little thing. That's a part of you. That's it's the first fruits of the spirit that we have, but that's not the whole embodiment in its actuality. It's it's something that guides you. It directs you to his instructions to do them. Right. So you, like as you said, so we're going through the sanctification process and circumcising our hearts, but then the end result is everything we just discussed about. Right. That's right. Yeah, and the end result is what we're reading here in Enoch chapter five. And that's why this, man, I just, he, Enoch is not pulling any punches right out the gate. It's no wonder, in my opinion, that um, certain people would want to take this out of the canon. And then it's no wonder that certain good-hearted people who want to know God's word try to read this and don't understand it. And so they think it's, it's not valid because they don't understand these concepts like the gospel, the kingdom of God. And what these phrases are throughout the prophets that refer to that event. And they don't understand these idiomatic phrases that are used constantly to refer to the first resurrection as well. You know, so we have, unfortunately, in our modern society, especially here in the U.S., I know that you're up there in Canada, right? Um, our wonderful northern brethren. But a lot of, you know, and maybe you may experience a very, very similar um, culture in the churches up there. But in the United States, we have a culture of lots of denominations. And each denomination, on almost all of them, I mean, not all of them, but almost all of them, teach this idea that, that God's laws are no longer to be obeyed, that we're just naturally going to do them in the spirit because we're in the new covenant. Yet people don't know what, you know, but that's not happening in the reality of looking at someone's life. It's not happening. And that's not the reality of what the Bible teaches either, because the Torah, you know, God's instructions for our life are eternal. So there's this what they call dispensation where God has dealt differently with people over different times. And so part of that dispensation teaching is that the law is done away with. And if you think that you're going to have a hard time recognizing and understanding when you're reading about the first resurrection and when you read about the gospel, the kingdom of God in Isaiah, where it says that the law of God will go forth from the kingdom to the world and that people are required to obey the law of God in the prophets, like in Zechariah. So you're, so if you're if you're coming from that mentality, if you're coming from that teaching, um, I I implore you just test everything we're saying. I came from that teach from that understanding and that type of denominational mindset, and heard from different denominations that same premise being taught, and that we're just we just because we have the Spirit through the the priesthood of Yeshua now that we don't. We don't have to obey the instructions of God. They're just written on our heart. We're going to do them already when we walk in love. Yet the Bible itself defines love itself as doing the instructions of God. So, <laughs> yeah. so we have this, this contradiction that's being taught, but a lot of people don't catch it because that's all they've been taught, right? So if you're hearing this for the first time and you're a part of a denominational church, I just want to implore you to test everything we're saying. Dig into these verses, all these supplemental verses that we're We'll be going through and referencing in the canon of 66 in the in the scriptures that we have in our collection of Bible in most most homes. And we're comparing them to what we're reading in Enoch. I, I want to encourage you to, to line them up as we're doing with you. And you can see things like this, like the gospel of the kingdom, like the, the behavior of the, of the kingdom, which is the Torah, uh, the instructions of God for living, and like the first resurrection, these big concepts that all intertwine together. And this will open up your understanding of the Bible in front of you to where it becomes a joy and to where explaining God's promise of hope and salvation for us in practical terms that people can grab a hold of in a conversation within minutes 
will become a resource for you and you'll be edified by it. <clears throat> so I just, I, I really want to encourage everyone watching that they would do that. Amen. I second that. All right. So we're in chapter six. Yeah, this is a controversial one. Not that the other one before weren't. Um, right. So, so we're, we're getting into Genesis six boundary, right? <laughs> So just a, a quick, a quick controversial recap. We should, I should put up on the side screen, just, you know, controversial topics already listed. And we're just going to add to that laundry list. Yeah. So what uh, we have chapter one, um, we have, um, uh, the tribulation time, right? That this book itself was meant for the, for the end generations to be aware of these concepts. It goes right into the gospel, the kingdom of God, everything that entails chapter two goes right into the biblical creation model. Um, and how that, you know, goes against what we've all been taught in our modern society, um, which is very interesting, right? Because maybe you need to know the counter, the counter idea to what we've been taught all of our life, um, because it may be helping you understand what we're about to read with the rest of this book. And, and then we go into some trees. I'm not sure about that. But then four and five, we get right into the seasons, how things move. We get right into chapter five, which talks about the first resurrection and the Torah transgressing the law and how we have the promise and we're going to be freed from the curse, the law of sin and death, right into an incorruptible body. Um, so we have a quick recap of the first five chapters is like Mike Tyson hitting you with a combo, right? If you've been in, in a church that you felt dead, that you felt like the teaching hasn't been uplifting you or encouraging you or giving you clarity of what the Bible says, first five chapters of Enoch are going to punch you in the face and the gut because uh, this will force you to dig into your book and take the word seriously. And I encourage everyone to do that. Now, chapter six is about to get even stronger. Okay. It says we're about to read about the enemy. And that's important for us to understand. Yeah. And Sean, uh, if I can interject here real quick before we get into it. Um, Genesis six, the implications of Genesis six were something that I struggled with all throughout my life, essentially my Christian life. And what I mean by that is we're taught that Yahweh commanded Israel to utterly destroy tribes of human people when they're entering into Canaan. And I just couldn't put that, I couldn't reconcile that with a loving God to, to command his people to go in and just decimate, right? Decimate them because they, you know, they're sinners, they're pagans, or this and that. Thankfully, um, Yahweh directed me to Brother Rob Skiba, another shout out to him. Um, with his Nephilim work and understanding Genesis 6 in its proper contextual light. And so um, this was a monumental part of my faith walk in terms of my understanding. It really shot me into many different um, concepts and, and, and thematic understandings that solidified my faith. And it started with the Nephilim and the giants and what we're going to come across right now. Yeah. I'll start reading there, man. Okay. <clears throat> And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. So the diff it's telling us right here, it's the children of men that had multiplied in those days and beautiful daughters of the men. Verse two, and the angels, the children of heaven, so we have a different class, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, come, let us choose us wise from among the children of men and beget us children. And Simeaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear you will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us all swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual implications not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. And then swear they all together and bound themselves by mutual implications upon it. And they were in all 200 who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon. And they called it in Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And these are the names of their leaders, Simyaza, their leader, Arekaba, Ramael, Kokabael, Temael, Ramael, Danel, Ezekiel, Barakel, Asael, Armos, Betarel, Ananel, Zakael, Semsepael, Satrel, Turel, Yomael, Serel, these are the chief of their tens. So I think it's interesting, Sean. I know we got a lot to talk about here, but um, the version that I'm reading off of has the name Jared bolded, which I think is um, important to know that that contextually lines up with 
Genesis 6, right? It says in those days, you know, there were Nephilim and after that, when the sons of God and the after that in the, in those days is Jared, right? And yeah. we can talk about that if we want to or whatever, but. Well, first off, I just want to, <clears throat> I just want to give you a high five across the screen for pronunciation. <laughs> you know, those names without messing up. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, well, I read them quickly so that it would just like kind of right. meld into each other and you wouldn't know. Right. That's uh, that's impressive. Um, we've got what I think is interesting here in verse three. All right. So we're, we're reading about, I mean, th this does not mince words. Angels, they took women as wives and had, and had babies with them. Right. So this is not the way things were designed. This was out of order. Right. You are out of order, sir. So this these angels and then they're talking about doing this in verse three. They're having a discussion. We get the behind the scenes fly on the wall conversation that Semyaza, who was apparently the leader of some of these guys, says, I fear you will not indeed agree to do this deed. I alone should pay the penalty of the great sin. And then they all came back and they're like, well, no, that's fine. We'll just mutually imprecate ourselves through an oath. We'll just bind ourselves together through an oath to do this great sin with you. You know, what I, mean? yeah. so I laugh because those must have been some attractive women. <laughs> <laughs> the genetics were just so impressive in those days. I mean, good Lord. We're talking angels, man. We're talking people that, you know, they come down from above the firmament from the heavenly realm to, you know, in the book of uh, Jubilees tells us that these guys were called the watchers. We're reading about the, they're called the watchers in this book as well and that they were intended to come down to mankind to help us govern because as man began to multiply on the earth, they were having trouble interacting with each other because of their new sin nature. And so the angels came down as rulers and judges to help them govern their affairs, right? But yeah. while they were here, they started being attracted to some of the some of the hotties, apparently, that were running around pre-flood. And so um, I think that uh, this is pretty wild because we also read in Jubilees, that the angels, when they were born, were born, or excuse me, not born, but when the angels were created, specifically the angels in heaven, they were they were created circumcised. Yeah, that's an interesting little detail, eh? That right? Yeah, these are guys. These are actual guys. These are not women angels. These are men with men me members with men parts, yeah. specifically circumcised men parts. So. <clears throat> And that's how they were made a creation. Yeah. So when people try to say that, oh, you know, they, you know, this is just nonsense. This was just the, the kids of Cain and the kids of Jared, the kids of Seth, you know, different sides of the family that like we see in Genesis 4 and 5. And that they were interacting with each other. And, you know, Cain's kids, they were, you know, they were called the daughters of men. And Jared or Seth's offspring in that line, you know, that, that family tree, they were called, you know, the sons of God, you know, as being referenced as angels here. And that is not at all what the narrative says, nor is it actually what the Hebrew says in, in Genesis. But then we have books like Enoch, chapter 6, which just, like I said, that doesn't mince words and expounds very, very plainly that these were angels from heaven that came down, and they were men angels, and they took women, right? Yeah. Um, and they did men, they did manly things with women and had babies with them, okay? Yeah. So this, is a, this is a unique, you know, very specific passage. So to me, it makes you wonder. Now, there's other places where it says that angels assumed many different forms because they had that power, right? Because they're, you know, they're not normal creations like we are. They're a little, they're, they have their own unique gifts and abilities, so to speak. But in this case, they definitely showed up as men, interacting with men, uh, with menly intentions, so to speak, um, towards a woman's genetics. And then they had offspring that they had babies. And they knew this was bad and decided that they need to talk about it beforehand. And I think that's fascinating to me because talk about, you know, talk about premeditation, right? If you're talking yeah. legal terms. And this is why we're going to see later they were not granted mercy. This was not a mistake that they made ignorantly. This was a mistake that they made full well knowing what they were doing. And they tried to skirt, you know, blame for it by somehow thinking, well, if we all do it together, <laughs> then, you know what I'm saying? Um, then it'll be fine. We'll be let off. Yeah. Free pass, potentially, if it's a bunch of us doing it. You know, it. we're looking at here, Ken, this is the first union. 
Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. What? Oh, yeah, okay. This is the first mob you get. Yeah. It's like, hey, we all do it together. You know? Yeah, we're, going, we're all going down together, right? They'd have to take yeah. us all out, you know? Yeah. Bob's not going to do that. Oh, yes, he does. He takes yeah. them all out. Just a quick addendum, Sean. So the Watchers aren't only these, you know, rebellious dissenting angels, right? We also have classes or individuals that are also watcher class, like Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, we're going to come to all their names. Yeah. We're the good ones. And, and these ones were showing up with Abraham, three angels, right? A lot of people stumble and, and you know, get a little lost in the text when it talks about three men showing up. Well, that's a theosophy, right? That's Jesus showing up because he's a man and blah, blah. Right. Well, no, who, they're if, angels. If that's true, then who are the other two men? Yeah, exactly. And the wrestling match with Jacob. Village, bring him with him. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not it's not a stretch. It's not a stretch at all. We're and we're showing this bit of context for a reason that these watchers can, like you said, assume many forms, and one of them is they can come as men. That's right. Very convincingly, the Book of Tobit actually shows how convincing that is too. We, we can potentially get into that one one day, but. Yes, these are angels, and they come as men, and there's no issues with that. No, it's all throughout Scripture. Yeah. Acts chapter 16, a dude walks in the jail and lets Peter out of jail. There's literally a jailbreak from an angel. <clears throat> you know, and he comes up like a man. He just looks like a man walking through there. You know, it's just like, yeah, it's, it's amazing that, um, that, you know, we've got people just don't take the word seriously, and they just make up all these wild stories and ideas and theories and so I'm just excited that we get to put on film for people to, to consider and dissect. We're going to take this as contextually and as seriously and as literally as our good common sense will allow us, you know, and uh, through discourse and conversation, we keep, it to, keep each other in check through that. And as you're watching this, you know, you're welcome to write in the comments any questions you may have. Um, if you think we missed something or didn't expound upon a certain part, you know, uh, <clears throat> But just a summation of this last chapter here, Sean. So we have women of men being eyeballed greatly by the sons of heaven. Yeah. And they come upon Mount Hermon. I believe the summit of it is Artis. I believe it's called in, in Jubilees. There might even be in this chapter or later chapter. But they come upon the summit of Mount Hermon. They make an oath together saying, we're going to do this, guys. There's 200 of them. We're given the names of the chiefs of the tens of them are here. And the over you know, the chief of the chiefs is Semyaza, okay? Yeah, and the fact that, I mean, the angels are a kind, right? When Yahweh created creations, the angels are a kind. Humans are a kind. We go through all the creatures, the land creatures that were all after their kinds, and the seed creatures after their kinds. Everything's after their kinds. And so the angels are a kind, and they came and blended with our kind. Right. Just like they were blending the kinds of creatures, um, back in their day as well, where we get these chimeric, you know, mythological creatures throughout antiquity. What we're experiencing today, right, where the Messiah is just like, as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. We're seeing blending of species today uh, for medical reasons and uh, plants and all these other things. It's no different than back then. So it's not a stretch to think that the angels being a kind came and, and messed around with our kind. That's right. And it tells us that their children were of a unique kind. Yes. Which I think is interesting. All right, so this is, we just, we just, saw, the, um, we just saw the enemy being introduced in Enoch, right? These guys are coming in, they're messing with the affairs of men, and they're about to cause a lot of problems. We even get them called out by name, which I think is pretty fascinating. And I appreciate you joining us for this first episode of Honor of Kings. We're digging into Chapter 1 of Enoch, the controversial and famous book of Enoch. And then next week, we're going to pick up with chapter seven in episode two, and we're going to explore further who these enemy angels are, what they're doing with mankind, and what becomes of them, um, and what they're, you know, all the, all the drama that ensues. We just got into the heat of the drama, and so I hope that you enjoyed this episode this week. Make sure to join us next week where we pick up the continuation of this. Ken, do you have anything to say? No, it's just been fun, man. Um... This is an important book, guys. It really is. It's full of full of lots of things that can really help your understanding of the scriptures, the canon. Um, as you can see, it makes total sense to get rid of this book, um, to just completely discard it and discredit it by calling it, you know, 
uh, fables or second temple Judaism writings that, you know, we're just messed with. And, um, well guys, the context, it proves itself. It passes the litmus test and you'll see as we go along that it really does expound on many things that seem to be silent in, uh, the 66 canon. So I just, thanks for watching and, uh, we look forward to seeing you guys next time. Yeah. Thanks guys. Um, be sure to check us out next week and I, uh, leave uh, comments and questions down below. And if you liked it, make sure to like, share, and subscribe um, both to the channel, but just share this on, on social media, help us get the word out because this is important information that a lot of people can benefit from. All right, we'll see you next time.